It's hunting season again and the Predator is back to claim some more human trophies. Predator 2 was released in 1990 and set in the futuristic world of... Um... 1997 where another predator creature arrives for the victory of killing. However, this time the setting has changed from taking place in the jungle to an urban city setting, taking the action to the streets of LA. The story follows Lieutenant Harrigan, played by Danny Glover, who, along with his group of fellow officers, has his work cut out for him on the account of the city's violent turf gang wars and extreme heatwave. But things go from bad to worse when strange and mysterious deaths start taking place, where it becomes clear that Harrigan must face a terrifying alien creature. In this action-packed sequel, which also stars Bill Paxton, Gary Busey, with Kevin Peter Hall reprising his role as the Predator. So today, we are returning to the Predator universe, or as I like to call it, the Prediverse. As we look into 10 things that you didn't know about Predator 2, check it out, we shall. Number 10, it started off with six scripts. After the huge popularity and success of the first Predator movie, 20th Century Fox were keen to make a sequel, with Joel Silver returning as producer. Brother writing team Jim and John Thomas, who wrote the original movie, were asked to come back to write a Predator sequel, to which they pitched six different ideas for where the next Predator movie could go. The idea 20th Century Fox liked the most was setting the action on the streets of a rough city, with the emphasis being that Predator 2 is set in a different kind of jungle, a jungle of steel and concrete. I don't know what the other five ideas were, but I'm willing to bet that at least one of them was set in space. Number 9, the Schwarzenegger sequel without Schwarzenegger. Considering that the original Predator was an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, it only would have made sense to get the action-packed buff man back for the sequel. And it was intended for Schwarzenegger to star in Predator 2 to reprise his character Dutch. However, seeing Arnie take on the alien monster again never ended up happening. Now, there are several stories behind Arnie not returning to Predator 2. One being that it was a money dispute and that he wanted more money than the studio was going to give him. Another theory is that he just couldn't commit to the project because he was already tied up to filming Terminator 2 Judgment Day at the time. Another Arnie sequel. So instead, Predator 2 focused on an ensemble cast playing LAPD officers. So I guess that Arnie had two sequels from his movies to choose from and, well, he chose Terminator. Number 8. Freddy Krueger got the director the job. Predator was directed by Jamaican-born British-Australian director Stephen Hopkins, who got the job because producer Joel Silver was so impressed with the director's work on A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. Which I find weird. I mean, don't get me wrong, A Nightmare on Elm Street 5 is good, but it's not, oh my god, I need to get the director of this movie to make my film good. Or at least in my opinion. When Hopkins got on board, he even helped to work on Predator 2's script and storyboards. And it must be said that Hopkins does a pretty good job on Predator 2, and had a great cinematic eye. The irony is, also in 1990, Die Hard 2 came out, which was directed by Rennie Harlan, who previously directed A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. Okay, in 1990, were they just getting A Nightmare on Elm Street directors to direct action sequels? Like, what's the connection? I don't get it! What, was Wes Craven unavailable to direct Delta Force 2 or something? Number 7. Difficulties in Filming Predator 2 was originally intended to be filmed in New York City. However, for economic reasons, the production shifted to Los Angeles, with most of the film being filmed on the streets of LA. However, filming in the buzzing city wasn't easy, as the cast and crew often had to deal with angry locals, who weren't happy that their day-to-day -day lives were being affected by the movie's filming. There are even stories out there that angry local residents were so fed up with the crew, they threw bags of urine and feces at members of the production. 
Ew. Number six, real life detective work. Predator 2 had an impressive lineup of actors appearing in the movie. Both Danny Glover and Gary Busey were cast because producer Joel Silver had previously worked with the actors on Lethal Weapon. Bill Paxton played the wise-mouthed Detective Lambert. The irony being, he also played a wise guy in the Aliens sequel, Aliens. Maria Conchita played the tough, no-nonsense Detective Cantrell. Prior to Predator 2, Conchita also starred opposite Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Running Man. And in order to prepare herself as an LAPD detective, Conchita actually worked on the streets with a real-life female LAPD detective, one who specialised in ritualistic murders. The officer would often tell Conchita some pretty grisly stories involving previous cases, like dead bodies being sold in plastic bags for ritual purposes. Wow, Conchita sure went all out for her role. Number 5. It gave birth to the Alien vs Predator franchise Alien vs Predator is not just a spin-off pairing two of Hollywood's most feared alien creatures against each other, but over the years it has actually become an actual franchise in its own right, resulting in video games, movies and much much more. However, the whole Alien vs Predator brand basically started with Predator 2, in a scene where Harrigan enters the Predator's spaceship, where on display a skull of the alien xenomorph can be seen which instantly gave the two franchises a shared universe. It was decided that it would be a nice easter egg to put in the movie, as both the Alien and Predator franchises were owned by 20th Century Fox. But a simple cameo this was not, as after the release of Predator 2, fans were demanding to see an epic showdown of aliens and predators. The very year that Predator 2 came out, the very first Alien vs Predator comic also came out. So the epic duel had started. However, fans would have to wait 14 years to finally see Alien vs Predator battle it out on the big screen. And <gasps> nobody liked it. Number four, novelization. Yeah, there was indeed a novelization of Predator 2. I guess written for those who just needed a more in-depth explanation to the story of Predator 2. Hey, they probably exist, who knows. The novel was written by Simon Hawke, who has also written novelizations for Star Trek and Friday the 13th. But what makes the Predator 2 novelization so interesting is that it actually gives a more in-depth explanation as to what happened to Dutch. Well, according to the book, Dutch ended up in hospital after his one-on-one -on -one fight with the Predator and was suffering radiation sickness. And before he could be questioned, Dutch escaped from the hospital never to be seen again. Did he just lay low forevermore, or did he succumb to radiation sickness? Who knows? So after all this time, he had to get to the chopper, only to jump out of a hospital window. The novelization also gives an insight into the Predator's psyche, as we learn how his mind works and feels, which is interesting. There is also an extension of Dutch's story with the comic books, which actually predate Predator 2, in which Dutch's older brother, Alan Schaefer, is a New York City cop where he too encounters predators, and even travels to the jungles of Valverde to try and learn more about the predator aliens and what happened to his brother. Yeah, a bit of a coincidence really, isn't it? That the Predator comics took place in the city and then the sequel ended up taking place in the city. Hmm. Number three, movie poster. There was actually two main posters used to advertise Predator 2. First of all, there was this one, with the Predator and a heap of skyscrapers behind him, emphasising the switch from jungle to city setting. I actually really like this poster, however, I do think it looks a little animated. You know, it makes Predator 2 look like a cartoon. The most well-used poster was this one, which just uses what looks like a random production photo of the Predator. It kind of looks like the photo was taken mid-scene, and that the Predator looks a little caught off guard, but hey, I still like it. I like its use of dark blue and atmospheric feel, and it's a good contrast to the original movie's poster which just had Arnie on it. Then there was the Japanese poster, which was interesting, as it just looks like a cut and paste job of all the characters all awkwardly being put together, with the Predator looking above, which by the way looks really grainy and pixelated. I'm guessing it's trying to look like the Predator's vision? Now, usually I really love Japanese versions of movie posters, but this one just doesn't do it for me. Number two, release. 
Predator 2 was made on a budget of $35 million and only brought back $57.1 million at the box office being not a financial failure, but a disappointment, especially in contrast to the original movie, which made $98.7 million. However, the movie was ripped apart by critics and still currently holds 26% on Rotten Tomatoes. Critics felt that the movie was too violent, mean-spirited, and ugly. And as I often say in this show, what were they expecting? Did they even see the first movie? Despite its criticisms, the movie has had a huge following of fans from over the years who like Predator as much, if not more, than the original. Right now, Predator 2 is probably even more popular than ever, with there even recently being toys, action figures, and other memorabilia. Number 1. Drastic Cuts Had To Be Made Before Predator 2's major release, drastic cuts had to be made to the movie on the account that it was felt that it was just way too violent. Originally, Predator 2 was going to be given an NC-17 rating, but the studio wanted an R rating, so in order to get the R rating, over 20 cuts had to be made to the movie. Wow, so we can only imagine just how violent Predator 2 was before its cuts. Even here in Australia, Predator 2 was considered very violent and was given an R18 rating, which is an extreme rating here in Australia. Also keep in mind that the original Predator had a softer M15 rating in this country. And despite the fact that there have been some uncut editions of Predator 2 released over the years, I wonder if we will ever see all the scenes that were cut and see Predator 2 in its entirety, as it was intended to be seen. So that was my look into Predator 2. It's a fun, violent action movie romp that is more than competently made. I see it as being more of a spin-off than a sequel, as to me it doesn't feel like the original movie, but rather a different take on the Predator mythology, along with different surroundings and different characters. So I say check it out, it's worth a viewing. Anyway, I'm Minty, and no matter what you want to say about Predator 2, it is still the best Predator sequel. See ya! <laughs>
The picture is coming. Oh, look at that. It has just evaporated into a picture. I am so excited. I can hardly contain myself. Woohoo! That is awesome. And if you look carefully, it's actually the, the starter screen to Super Mario Land. Whoever made this cup really had a thing for Super Mario Land. They're like, to hell with Tetris. We're going to be focusing our Game Boy mug on Super Mario Land. Hell yeah, why not? So let's just turn around and see what we get on the other side. Trying not to burn myself. Ah, and there, of course, is the, uh, I don't know if you can see the Daisy scene where Mario saves Daisy and she turns into a moth or something. And, uh, yeah, you rub it and, no, it's, <laughs> there it is. I'm actually really, I'm actually really, really impressed with this. This was totally worth $5. So I'm going to uh, tip the water out now and I'm going to see how long it takes uh, for it to go back to black. So let's see what happens. Okay. Okay, nothing was happening, so what I did, like I sat there for a good two, three minutes, nothing was happening, so I, so I poured some cold water onto it, and as you can see, the cold water is now causing another kind of reaction. It's sort of making the picture go a bit, you know, a bit all mushy, and go, going back to what it was like before I had the hot water poured in. So this is actually a really cool cup. It's totally worth the money, totally worth it if you're a collector of awesome stuff like I am. The only thing about this mug that might get a little bit tricky is that it specifically says on the box that you cannot put it in the dishwasher. This is a cup that you're going to want to wash by hand. And I'm guessing in order for that to happen, you're going to want to keep your cup in pretty good condition. You don't want to scratch it by scrubbing it too much. So maybe just use it for cold drinks. Don't have like anything like hot chocolate where you can get like, you know, big chunky bits that are stuck on it that require lots and lots of scrubbing. So that's the only downfall. You can't put it in a dishwasher and I'm guessing you have to be really careful with how you clean it, especially if you want to keep it in good condition like this. But other than that, yeah. This is a really cool cup. I'm actually really, really happy with this. All right, guys, until next time, um, happy Game Boy mug drinking, I guess. Yeah, just, just one more. Oh, look at that. Here it comes. All right, see yous.